Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about some uh, recent work that we've done on visual reasoning via feature-wise linear modulation. So, as I think probably all of you know, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of recent progress recently uh, for basic visual tasks like object recognition. Um, you know, this is sort of goes without saying that the basic driving force behind this is our models such as the convolutional neural net. This is really the workhorse of deep learning applied to vision. And it's, I think it's just worth really saying how elegant this model really is. I'm a big fan of this model. Um, but the other reasons why we're seeing this kind of advances that we're, we have right now are things like accessibility of large data sets that we never had before. And another thing that people mention is that, well, we have like huge computational resources now and things like GPU that we didn't have before. And these are really uh, major reasons why we're, we are where we are. And these, uh, these two items are often quoted as why we see deep learning as being the success it is. But one thing that people don't often say, which I'd like to really emphasize here, is that we also have made real tr advances in, in these learning algorithms and the models themselves. And, and really, since 2012 on, on the ImageNet, which, it, which I'm showing you here, um, all of, that ed all of that progress is essentially because of the, the advances we've made to the learning algorithms and models. So, so it's really an exciting time to do this kind of science. And, and it's not only because of the computational resources and, and data resources. And I'd like to I think that the kind of work I'm going to be telling you about today is actually going to be uh, contributing to that, uh, that aspect. All right, so, so with all this tremendous progress on basic uh, sort of vision tasks like object recognition. Many researchers have sort of moved on to more challenging tasks. And one of these is visual question answering. So, so this is an interesting task, because from the vision point of view, we can actu it actually presents a, a fine-grained semantic probe that allows you to sort of probe the relationship between objects in a scene and see how much our algorithms actually understand. And as we build these data sets, we can actually get them to understand the visual scene a little bit more carefully than just presenting a blanket uh, object recognition label. From a language point of view, this is, it's also very interesting because it allows us to ground our language. A lot of times when we just do pure NLP tasks, we're, we're left with the sense that the language is so, sort of just, the models are learning just this kind of, uh, a st uh, like the, well, uh, basically just the statistical or rather surface statistical relationships between words and sentences. Presenting it with another modality like, like images allows us to really get at the meaning of these words. So, so I think it's, it's a very exciting task from these two domains. And a few of us are actually going beyond this kind of uh, task, and we're, we're trying to explore, explore things like uh, visual dialogue. And so our contribution in this domain is a game we call Guess What. So Guess What is a, is a well, it's a visually oriented, or visual task oriented dialogue game uh, where we've collected data from Mechanical Turk subjects uh, and who are incentivized to cooperate, meaning we actually give them a bonus when they get when they win this game and we play little games. Um, and the advantage of it being in a game setting is that there is a clear objective and evaluation both for humans and for our agents, which is another issue that we see when we have dialogue uh, components, is that it's often hard to evaluate whether a dialogue is, a, is successful or not. Within a game setting, if the two players manage to, you know, if one of the two players, the, the questioner in this case, manages to guess the right object, then we know that there's been an information exchange and a successful dialogue. So get, getting more into what the game is, is we have, it's a two-player game where we have two players, an oracle and a questioner. So the oracle sees an image much like what's shown here, right? Where it's, uh, it's just an image and there's a highlighted object. In this case, it's the, it's the man. Uh, in the air, it's highlighted in, in, by, a, by a segmentation mask. And the questioner sees the same image only without the highlighted segmentation mask. So he doesn't know what the target object is. And the game here is now the questioner starts asking questions, and the oracle answers these questions, yes or no, and, and uh, to the point where the, the questioner now tries to guess which is the target object. And so that's an example of the game over here. So I'm going to take you through sort of what it looks like. So from the questioner's point of view, this is the image that he sees. From the oracle point of view, this is the image that they see. So one of the birds here is highlighted. That's the target object. But the questioner, of course, doesn't know that. So the questioner is going to start asking questions. Is it a bird? In this image, that's a pretty safe bet. So yes, in fact, it is. And what I'm showing you here is actually a, this isn't a cooked example. This is a true example from the data set. Uh, is it on the left side? No. Uh, starting from the right, is it the first one? So that would be. 
that would be, I guess, this bird right there. That one right there. Uh, no, it's not, because we know which one it is. Uh, one of the two birds, so this is now a, a context, right? It depends, the, this point in the dialogue depends on the context, which was the question above, because we're moving from, from right to left. So the answer here is yes. And then is it the upper one? Well, we know that in fact it is yes, the upper one. So at this point, the, the questioner has actually guessed the correct answer and it and highlights this one. So just to let you know, the way this actually works is the, uh, the objects that are segmented then appear to the, to the questioner and he has to click on the right object and that's how the games are deemed successful if he clicks on the right one. Um, so this is another example. Uh, games have a tremendous amount of variability in there and how easy or hard they are. Uh, we, we built this off of the MS Coco data set. So here's one where, is it a person? The Oracle answers yes. Are they a player? No. Are they in the stands? Yes. OK, so now it gets a bit challenging, right? So then they go through a series of questions and answers. And uh, they sort of narrow down. And what's interesting about this is the, the questioner has to apply some sort of basic strategies of dividing up the space. They can either do that semantically, like in the first question, is it a person? They're semantically dividing up the space. Or you'll see later on, they, start, they can start doing this uh, spatially as well. And so from this point, so at this point, the, the, after this series of questions, this particular human guesser actually guessed the correct answer that it was this person right here. So uh, yeah. There might have been some luck in that, I'm not sure. Uh, but right, so now, now if we just think of this as just a task from the machine learning point of view, and now we're going to have a game between these two asymmetric agents, right, because they're playing very different roles. The oracle can be seen as somewhat of a kind of a traditional, maybe not so traditional, but it's, a, it's essentially a, a supervised learning task, right, where the input is the image itself, the series of questions, in particular the question that it has to answer at that moment, plus the history of questions, and then some features that are about the object category and location, and the output here is either a yes-no answer. Actually, I'm lying just a little bit, there's also a non-applicable possibility, so it's not a binary classification task, just, for, uh, just in case the question doesn't make sense to the oracle. On the questioner side, this is a more interesting task in some sense, and that in that the, the, you actually have to come up with questions to resolve a strategy. So you can actually frame this as a reinforcement learning task, right? Here, where, the, where the inputs are the image, possibly previous question answer pairs, so, you, so you're developing a history of, of your belief effectively about what the object might be. And then the output net is how to, is, is essentially the next question, right? So, so it's, a, it's a fairly challenging task because your action space is is essentially the number of words that you have that define your, your, your questions. And you have to come up with a series of words to make, make a question that makes sense that allows you to divide up the space of possible target objects. So for this task, in the case when we're treating it as reinforcement learning, the oracle we're going to treat as part of the environment. It's going to be fixed and part of the environment. And what's interesting about this is we actually, to do reinforcement learning in this case, we actually need our, our robot or our, an agent to be the oracle, right? Because we have to train up an oracle. We're just going to use a baseline oracle in this case. And it has to be able to respond in a sort of a, a live case for, to, the, to the questioner because it's in a reinforcement learning setting. So we're running this in a simulation where the oracle is acting as our, as our environment, essentially. And now to do this, we need to train up an oracle to do a reasonable job. And this is just a... a I'm showing you in, in the picture here what the environment, oops, sorry, what the environment looks. This is essentially just uh, ImageNet features coming in from the image and then to an LSTM, which actually generates the, the words, the questions, and then they get the answer. And uh, again, the strategy here is to come up to a series of questions to resolve what is the correct object. And of course, in this case, what we're going to do for reward, we're going to give it one if the guesser guesses correctly. Guesser is the same thing as questioner here, and uh, zero if not. All right, so when we do that, we can actually see that we, we get a significant improvement in reward or in, in, in accuracy relative to humans. That's what's shown, oops, that's what's shown here is, is accuracy for the guess from the questioner relative to human performance. So 100% here indicates you're doing as well as humans do at this task. Um, and we see a significant improvement when we apply reinforcement learning over our baseline. What our baseline here is in this case is it's just trying to copy what the humans would do in that setting. 
So we're comparing a model trained with reinforcement learning versus one that's just trying to copy what humans are doing. And we're seeing that we see significantly better results when we use reinforcement learning in this setting. But the, here's the issue. The issue is that when we actually go in and analyze why we're getting better results with reinforcement learning, what we see as a dominant effect is it's just that the RL agent learns what kind of questions the oracle is bad at answering. And it learns just not to ask those kinds of questions. So we've got this interesting effect that we see an improve in in improvement in, in performance, but it's essentially just responding to its environment, which is this oracle that isn't necessarily perfect, because it's just a model we've trained up, and the, it itself get, has a, a fairly limited accuracy. So what this really tells us is, for this task, in order to really do much better on the oracle or on the questioner side, we're going to have to go and revisit the oracle and do a better job at, at training the oracle. So just uh, going, so this is the baseline oracle that we use, and, and I just wanted to highlight, the, in this case, the model structure. So we've just got a bunch of features coming in about the object, the image itself, and the question here. So the question's here, the features are here, and the context is there. And what we're doing is we're just concatenating these together and then passing that to an MLP. That's our baseline model. And what we did in work that will be presented at NIPS uh, in, I guess, December, uh, is that we've actually modified this with a model that we took inspiration from one of my students while he was at Google. He did this work, um, shown here, a learned representation for artistic style, where he proposed a new algorithm which, uh, which can be no termed a number of different things. It's also possibly known as conditional batch normalization. And uh, we actually showed that you can do significantly better at answering these questions in this framework. And we're going to explore this model, but we're going to do so in a slightly different setting. We're going to step away from this guess what game, and we're going to talk about something else that we call visual reasoning. And we're going to do that in the context of the, what's called the clever data set. So this is a data set developed by FAIR, uh, Facebook AI research. And it's basically like, quest, like visual question answering, but it's a little bit more advanced in that the questions are usually structured such that there's a sort of a, a, re, a line of reasoning that has to happen before you can get the answer, like we see in this example. So the setting is, it's a completely synthetic data set. The images are rendered as well as the question is, is, uh, is generated from a script. Uh, but there's 700,000 examples in the synthetic data set, and the questions are not necessarily very... Uh, very straightforward. So here's an example. What number of cylinders are small purple things or yellow rubber things? Anybody have an answer? Two. I've heard two. Excellent. Yes. That is the right answer. OK. So these kinds of models, if we look at the kinds of things that are doing well at this task, look something like this. So we have here, oops, sorry. Um, this is essentially one of the state-of-the-art method. What I want to highlight here is just this part here. So we have an LSTM taking in the question, and then in the middle here is this program that essentially constructs the, the building blocks of how the solution mechanism, which is then passed to this structure here, which builds these out of neural, networks, uh, neural network module components. But to train this model, what they had to do was actually give it these programs that in, in this in, in the middle here, this predicted programs, they gave it that extra label information, which of course they had available because this is a synthetic data set. But in general, they won't have this kind of information and it's just a general task, like for example, the guess what game we showed. So stepping away from that there was uh, this other work, uh, relational networks, this is out of DeepMind, where they actually managed to not use those kinds of program labels to train this model, but still their structure was highly, you could say, engineered to this task. Here I just want to highlight that the way that this model works is essentially they construct sort of like a, a crosswise comparison of all little objects, which they consider these basic segments, these, these grid cells of features that come out of a ConfNet. So they're doing this crosswise comparison all along, and that's how they're actually able to score this. But it's not necessarily obvious that such, a, such an application would work well for other tasks, such as uh, some, something like the Guess What game. Um, so this is the kind of performance you see. And one might l conclude, and sort of I've heard this kind of discussion in the community, that when we're getting to this level of sophistication of tasks, you really need to sort of engineer specific performances and give strong prior information about the task to do well. And that's what you would sort of conclude from this pattern of results, what we see. Um, but our approach is going to be different, and it's essentially what we call film. So this is feature-wise linear modulation. And our network is actually very straightforward. So here's, sorry, the structure is just an LSTM coming in, or a 
GRU, which is a local variant of LSTM, through this linear structure, and then those impinge on these scaling and shifting parameters, which pass into a ConfNet pipeline here. And they, they go in right at this film point there, and there's a blow up in the square about what film looks like. It's, again, just a, these gammas which control scaling of the features in a feature-wise sense, so each feature across the whole feature map scales in accordance to those parameters, and then a shift, which is through the beta. So it's a model that doesn't, it's a very light model from a, from a prior, uh, from having, it's a reasonably weak priors, I would say, for this task. It's essentially a sentence coming in that modulates the convolutional pipeline coming out. We haven't described exactly what the data is at all, and it's not built into the model structure at all here. So if we compare how we do, we actually do very, very well on this task. Um, so we're essentially state-of-the-art without any program uh, data and without any uh, strongly task-oriented uh, design of our model. Um, so if we just look a little bit into the structure of the model, what we're starting to see is very interesting things. The model seems to learn the kind of underlying structure that you require to do this kind of visual reasoning. So if we look at the clusters, so the, on the, the picture on the left, we have the first layer film components, that, and we can see that the clusters are grouped around basic material properties. Things like uh, what material is it, what size is it, what, what color. Later film parameters with the, the, the T-SNE plot on the left. So these are just kind of representations of, of, these, of these parameters and what they look like. The, uh, they cluster on the left. The later film parameters are starting to cluster around task type, right? Are we looking for uh, equal components or is this a query type? They, they tend to cluster around that. So, so the model is actually learning to do the kind of modularization that we see built into the other models. So this is a, actually a very exciting uh, phenomenon for us. And this is just, if you look at the histogram of, these, of the activities of these shift and scaling parameters, we can see, so shifting are the gammas, sorry, scaling are, sorry about that, scaling are the gammas on the right and shifting is, is, sorry, shifting is on the right, scaling is on the left. And what we see is that these things are really acting sort of to turn off feature maps, it would seem. So, so if, the, if the scaling, for example, is close to zero, that essentially turns off that feature map. And that essentially seems to be how these things are working. Uh, we can generalize this task to clever humans. Now, this is a data set. So one might level of criticism at Clever suggesting that, well, we don't know how complicated this task is. It's synthetic. Maybe these seem like difficult tasks to humans, but maybe they're actually very, very simple. And that's a reasonable criticism. So what the authors of the Clever data set did is they went and built a much smaller data set now, but one that are actually generated using human questions. And the humans were given explicit instructions to try to ask questions that might be difficult or, to, or able to confuse uh, an agent. Uh, so this is an example of the kind of thing that's asked. So, uh, you know, and the underlying words here are things that don't appear. These are words that don't appear in the original Clever data set. If we apply our model to this, we are state of the art if we just apply our model trained on Clever to this task. We don't do very well, 56.6%, but we're still state of the art. And this is, what's interesting about this is you would expect a model that has not a lot of prior structure to not necessarily generalize very well in this setting, yet we seem to generalize fairly reasonably. When we're allowed to fine tune on the Clever Humans data set itself, we do even better which is, I guess makes sense, um, given that the, this is a model that's fairly flexible and can adapt. And we, if we give the opportunity to adapt to the new language that's in the Clever Humans data set, it does fairly well. All right, so that's it. That's for me. So I will just conclude by saying that these kinds of VQA, visual dialogue, and visual reasoning tasks are a very interesting compromise, or a very interesting different aspects that are interesting. One is that it allows for detailed ex exploration of the semantics in the visual scene, and it allows us to ground our language that we use in these kinds of questions. Um, another point is that the details of the architectures matter, right? We, we had a model that we could concatenate, concatenate and it doesn't do very well, but we plug in this, this film kind of connection in a, in a very you know, particular way, and it seems to do much, much better. So sweating the details on the architectures actually is, seems to be worth it. Um, and finally, we're just sort of at the start of, of this kind of architectural feature and, and how broadly we can apply it, and we're really interested to find other ways that we can apply it. I've already seen it applied to, to our pure RL tasks. I've seen it applied to speech recognition in terms of speaker adaptation in a number of different cases. So it's, it's a particular feature that I would encourage you to explore in your own work.
We, it's a, it, to me, I, I, the way I describe it to my students is it's, just, it's a bit like salt and pepper, right? You just put it into whatever and it seems to make it better. All right, so I think that's it. Uh, if you're interested in playing with our Guess What game, there's a, a website you can play against the current agent. I believe the one that's on there right now actually is not using film, uh, but I hope to have it, that one up and, uh, soon. All right, thank you.